Good evening and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Cynthia Sturgeon, founder and president of Project Pink, and I'm so excited tonight to have you with Dr. Wong um, joining us to learn about reconstruction for breast cancer patients. So we're super excited to have you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank oh, you. it's going to be a great topic. So Project Pink is here to address the real issues um, that are facing breast cancer survivors today, and reconstruction is a really hot topic. There's so many different mm -hmm. options, and understanding what might work for one person may not be the best option for another, right? Right. Absolutely. So we want to really dispel some myths and answer those questions and get more educated about our options because we believe information is power and it basically helps you become your own advocate. So with that, as I said, I'm here with Dr. Shannon Wong and with Nebraska Medicine and she practices and does surgery at Village Point Aesthetic Surgeries in Omaha. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep, that's correct. <laughs> An assistant professor at the um, University of Nebraska. During our webcast, Dr. Wong is going to discuss the difference between immediate and delayed reconstruction, implant-based reconstruction versus autologous reconstruction, and discuss the benefits of the deep flap surgery, which there is a lot of people are begging for information about that, and you're one of the forefronts in Nebraska doing that surgery today, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I know there are lots of questions and we will get to all of them. Her presentation is phenomenal. I've seen it, so it's fantastic. Lots of information to absorb. The format tonight will be a presentation and because we had technical difficulties going live, we apologize for that. So this will be recorded. Thank goodness that professionally recorded, but we did ask you to submit your questions ahead of time. So what we're going to do is the format will be the same. She will actually present this incredible information to you. And then after that, I'll come back and moderate and ask some questions that you guys have submitted um, to Dr. Wong and we'll get those answered for you. And in the bottom, you can always respond to the YouTube um, where this will be placed. You can respond and put your questions there right on the Pink Survivors Unite or right in our YouTube channel. Either way, and we'll try to get those answered for you after the broadcast. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Great, and thank you so much, Dr. Wong. It's my we really pleasure. really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. So um, I'm just going to be talking about kind of the full gamut of breast reconstruction, which I understand can be quite um, overwhelming. So I'll try and break this down a little bit more simply. So let's start with the timing of breast reconstruction. So as far as timing's concerned, uh, really there's the immediate uh, breast reconstruction and delayed breast reconstruction. And it, it kind of is exactly as it sounds. Um, immediate breast reconstruction is done at the time or within usually a week of the mastectomy. Um, this means that we either put implants in at the time or use your own tissue. And the benefits of doing it immediately are that for some patients it's like less psychological stress um, given that you uh, come out of surgery, generally speaking, with a breast mound. Um, and in my hands, I feel that there's a bit of an improved aesthetic outcome when we do it right away as we're able to preserve most of the skin envelope um, in order to achieve a better uh, shape. Um, Delayed reconstruction is a really good option for patients who are not sure as to whether or not they want to undergo uh, breast reconstruction or are still kind of um, going back and forth. It doesn't really commit you to anything. I often tell my patients, you know, the easiest thing to do after mastectomy uh, in terms of healing is, you know, go forward with the, the mastectomy. It's really the reconstruction that actually uh, puts you through a little bit more in terms of um, recovery. And so for patients that are not quite sure, those that know they're going to need radiation afterwards um, or just don't have time to go through that healing process, uh, delaying their reconstruction is definitely a, a good and viable option. So next, what are um, the, what's the role of plastic surgeons in the treatment of breast cancer? So again, I'm not a um, surgical oncologist, but there are two main ways to treat breast cancer. The first is lumpectomy with radiation. Um, and the plastic surgeon's role in this case would be to perform the symmetry procedure um, on the contralateral breast, contralateral meaning the other breast, and then the mastectomy. And in that case, the, surgeon, uh, the plastic surgeon's role would be then to reconstruct the breast uh, using either an implant or their own tissue. And then in the case of unilateral mastectomy, meaning one-sided mastectomy, to then perform a symmetry procedure in the future. So we'll start with implant-based reconstruction. So uh, implant-based reconstruction is almost 
uniformly done with silicone implants as a final as a final stage, although some um, surgeons do use uh, saline. The advantages of using the implant is it's a much shorter operative time, uh, decreased early complication rate, um, shorter hospital uh, stay, and no donor site morbidity. The donor site is where we take uh, tissue from either be it your abdomen or your back or sometimes your buttocks to create a breast. Um, so that, that would be the donor site where we take the tissue from. So obviously when we take an implant off the shelf, then you're not going to be, um, then you're not going to have uh, any risk of having complications from, from those sites. Uh, limitations uh, using implants are, you know, problems with the implants. So um, capsular contracture and that scar tissue that forms around the implant that can cause it to become distorted. Uh, implant failure, and that refers to rupture, infection, exposure of the implant. Um, all things that would require uh, removal and possible replacement of the implant. Um, in unilateral reconstruction, it's oftentimes very difficult to get uh, to obtain symmetry between the non-reconstructed breasts when we're using an implant, and then multiple need for revisions, especially in young patients that are getting implants. You know, I always tell my patients, you're going to outlive the lifespan of these implants, so um, you know, be prepared for uh, surgeries in the future. There's three main areas on the chest wall that we can put implants. One is completely submuscular, and what that means is completely under the muscle. I don't often use this um, approach because one, it's very painful to try and expand, um, and two, we don't get a nice uh, um, lower pole fill of the breast, and that means that the um, portion of the breast from the nipple to the fold uh, is actually uh, doesn't get as round um, if we put it completely behind the muscle. Partial subpectoral, this is a very popular way to place a tissue expander or an implant after mastectomy. And what this means is partially behind the muscle. So we elevate the pectoralis major muscle and then we um, place a sling of what's called uh, acellular dermal matrix at the bottom side of the muscle. And this allows us to achieve better expansion of the um, mastectomy pocket and allows less pain uh, for the patients. Uh, Prepectoral implants, this is gaining a lot more popularity. Uh, this can only be done in certain patients who have very nice um, soft tissue coverage um, as you don't have the uh, muscle that covers the uh, top portion of the implant. Um, <clears throat> the nice thing about prepectoral implants is that this is much less painful for patients uh, because it's not disrupting the pectoralis major muscle. And uh, secondly, we um, don't have any problems with animation deformity. And animation deformity is anytime you flex your pectoralis major muscle, your uh, implant becomes distorted. It gets pushed down and outwards. Um, and so this eliminates uh, that problem. Um, implant reconstruction is usually done, I would say about 90% of the time or 80% of the time in two stages. Uh, the first is with placement of a tissue expander. Uh, and, and that's basically just a deflated implant uh, that we place at the time of the mastectomy and then over time um, uh, fill that with saline uh, to get um, stretching of that skin. Uh, this is an example of what a tissue expander looks like. Um, that little uh, magnetic port at the top is how we fill this in clinic. And then this uh, second picture, um, of the expander and what it would look like under the muscle is how we actually access it in clinic. Um, so every expander has a little magnetic port in it. We use a magnet on top of the skin to find it and then um, access it with the needle just like they do with the chemotherapy um, port. So once an expander is completely filled, then we usually wait in my case, usually around two months before we uh, go to the second stage. Now with every plastic surgeon, their timing may be a little bit different, uh, but generally speaking, I, I usually wait about eight, eight to 12 weeks. At the second stage, you come back, and this is usually done as an outpatient procedure. Um, we take out the tissue expander and then replace this, again, like I said, uh, usually with a silicone implant. Uh, the reason why we use silicone instead of uh, saline is because silicone is a little bit lighter, it's a lot softer, and you don't get a lot of the rippling that you do with the saline. As far as mastectomy incisions are uh, concerned, the traditional mastectomy incision uh, involves ellipsing out the nipple areola complex and then closing the uh, incision in a straight line across the breast, and that's still done uh, quite frequently. 
In this next slide, uh, you see with the skin sparing mastectomy incision, this is called a WISE pattern. And this is my preferred approach uh, with the onco uh, oncologic um, surgeon if they're comfortable with this approach. Uh, and this I, I usually use for patients who have nipples that hang below the nipple areal, uh, the, uh, sorry, nipples that hang below the inframammary fold. Mm -hmm. With the WISE pattern, um, what this allows is for us to be able to close the incision in an inverted T, uh, just like we do with uh, mastopexies and breast reductions. Uh, the reason why I like this approach so much is because it allows me to attain a much more uh, conical shape to the breast rather than an elongated kind of football shape. And it keeps the scar out of the cleavage, which is also, I think, very important. So I want to talk a little bit about nipple sparing mastectomy. Now, not everybody, unfortunately, is a candidate for a nipple sparing mastectomy. Um, there are two criteria you have to meet in order to be able to, uh, to have a nipple sparing mastectomy. And the first is up to your surgical oncologist. It depends on tumor location. Um, and so I always leave that first and foremost up to them. And then secondly is from an aesthetic standpoint. So this is a, basically a slide of what we call ptosis. And ptosis just refers to where the nipple sits in relation to the breast. So patients who are nipple sparing uh, candidates are patients who have um, usually smaller breasts and nipple areal complexes that sit um, above, the nip, uh, above the inframammary fold. Um, these are different incisions that we can use for nipple sparing mastectomy. Uh, what I like generally is an inframammary approach where they go along the uh, inframammary, um, uh, the natural inframammary crease or uh, periareolar where we do this lateral, uh, basically three o'clock uh, extension uh, from the nipple areola complex. The reason why um, nipple sparing mastectomy is nice is because in these cases, you know, we talked about two stage approaches, but in these cases, we can actually go direct to implant um, or one stage uh, breast reconstruction. And so it's nice to be able to go direct to implant, obviously for patients, because uh, I always caution patients is not that this will spare you from an additional surgery. Um, oftentimes we still need to go back and do some revisions here or there. Um, but if you're happy with um, your reconstruction, well, now you have a silicone implant in, you're not, um, you don't have an expander. We haven't committed you necessarily to having a second surgery within a year or two of your first. And so um, this has been a really nice um, way for us to do reconstruction as well. So radiation therapy and breast reconstruction, the reason why I bring this up is because there are a lot of patients, depending on nodal status, size of tumor, that are still gonna require radiation therapy after their mastectomy. Um, and I bring this up because post-mastectomy radiation, uh, or even sometimes in patients who have had lumpectomies radiation, any sort of radiation will greatly affect the blood supply uh, to, the, to the mastectomy skin. Um, and will also increase the rate of complications associated with implants up to about 40 percent. Mm -hmm. um, the risk of losing an implant or a reconstruction because of having radiation and the damage that it does cause to the skin, I quote upwards of 19 percent. Um, and that's either the implant gets exposed, the incision doesn't heal well, or patients develop infection. Um, and so there are other, uh, if you get past the healing point, there are other risks that go along with radiation therapy, that being capsular contracture, um, and just sometimes a poor cosmetic outcome. And so where radiation falls in the spectrum of reconstruction is usually if you're a patient that we put a tissue expander in, you'll heal from that, then get radiated. After radiation therapy, before we can do any further surgery, we do have to wait six, at least six months from the end of radiation before going back to the operating room. Um, and that's to allow for the skin to heal a little bit, um, to gain a little bit better blood supply. And why I put that slide there is because this leads me into autologous reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And autologous reconstruction uh, just means using your own tissue, whether it be from your back, your buttock, or your, your thighs. Um, and of course your stomach in order to reconstruct the breast. So the advantages of using your own tissue is that it replaces like tissue with like. So you replace um, what you lose with 
healthy living tissue with its own blood supply. So it feels and behaves like your own breast. It gains weight with you, it loses weight with you, it's warm to touch. Um, you know, some patients don't want it to, to um, necessarily age with them, but it, it, it is a benefit. Um, it's particularly advantageous as well in patients that are getting radiation therapy because it has the ability to resist some of the effects of the radiation therapy because unlike an implant, it does have its own blood supply. Um, on top of that, uh, it's really, I think, um, a much better aesthetic result in patients who are getting a unilateral mastectomy, so one-sided mastectomy, because it's much easier to um, match your native breast with uh, tissue that, that, is, um, that behaves and acts like a normal breast. Um, disadvantages to this is that it requires an additional surgery site, so that's what we're talking about, about risk of donor site morbidity, having complications from where we took the tissue from. Um, it's a much longer operation in most sense and um, a longer recovery as well as a longer hospitalization. But um, there have been a lot of studies that show that it exceeds implant-based reconstruction, again, in patients undergoing unilateral mastectomy and those undergoing uh, radiation therapy. So first I'll talk about pedicled flaps because this is what most plastic surgeons um, will be able to do um, in the case of needing to use your own tissue. And the first is a latissimus dorsi flap where we use the latissimus muscle with some skin. And basically pedicle means that we leave it attached to the blood supply and kind of just swing it around um, into the breast pocket. With the latissimus dorsi flap, um, this does not give us a lot of volume, but it does give us excellent soft tissue coverage. In this case, usually patients will still need to have um, an implant underneath the, um, underneath the tissue. In the case of uh, a tram flap, and now most plastic surgeons can perform this uh, flap, this is using your abdominal tissue to reconstruct a breast. How this differs from the deep flap, which I'll we'll talk more in depth about, is that because the blood vessels that supply the skin and soft tissue of the abdomen are so closely um, intertwined with the rectus abdominis muscle, which is one of your main abdominal muscles, um, most plastic surgeons will do this operation and because it's very difficult to dissect the blood vessels through the muscle, they'll just cut the muscle and flip the entire muscle up into the um, breast with the skin and, and soft tissue. Um, if you can do a deep flap, there's very, I, I don't, there, for me, there's no, I don't do this. Um, I do not do the tram flap anymore uh, because I am able to do the deep flap. Um, there is a certain amount of morbidity that's associated with using the entire rectus muscle, um, including hernias and bulges, which can still happen with the deep flap, but definitely um, higher risk with um, taking the entire muscle. And of course, then you you take that muscle and you no longer have that core strength associated with it. Um, so that brings me to the deep flap and this is one of my main areas of expertise. Um, we do a lot of deep flaps at Nebraska Medicine anywhere from one to two a week. Um, and the advantages of the deep flap is that it maximally preserves the muscle, okay? It completely preserves the fascia and what the fascia is is the strength of the anterior abdominal wall. If you think about the abdominal muscle as a pillow and the fascia as the pillowcase, um, it, it goes the whole way around the muscle. Um, and that's the integrity of the fascia is actually what really prevents us from getting hernias. Um, it also maximally, maximally preserves motor nerves, which will also decrease the ris risk of abdominal, wall, um, abdominal um, bulges and hernias. Uh, the disadvantages is it is a long operation. It's a long time for patients to be under, under general anesthesia, but generally speaking, our patients are younger, healthier. They do very well, even, even older patients. Um, and then, of course, the potential of hernias and bulges, which I quote usually less than 2%. Mm -hmm. um, so the following slide is just a schematic of how the operation is done. Um, we take the abdominal tissue kind of akin to how we would with an abdominal plasty. We elevate the skin and fat until we find these small little vessels that emerge from the rectus abdominis muscle. And then what I do is I chase these little uh, vessels through the rectus muscle until it meets up with the larger vessel on the backside um, called the deep inferior epigastric artery and vein. 
At this point, I'm able to cut the artery and vein and completely lift the skin and fat off of the patient. Okay, so now it's a piece of tissue uh, with a, an associated artery and vein. And so any living tissue needs blood supply in order to live. And so how we uh, do that is we go into the chest, we find the internal mammary artery and vein, which is an excellent donor blood vessel. Um, and then underneath the microscope, we hook up the artery to the artery and the vein to the vein. And so at the end of the case, what we have is arterial inflow through the flap and venous outflow. And that's what allows the tissue to live in its new um, position on the chest wall. And then from that, I'm able to cone a breast out of the um, skin and fat. So again, the nice part of this operation is it is your own tissue. Now it's a much bigger operation. It's a much uh, longer recovery. It's three days in the hospital compared to one after the mastectomy, which has gone down a lot from, it used to be seven to 14 days. Um, but also the um, lifting restrictions and things like that are much different. So with implant-based reconstruction, I usually tell my patients six weeks of no heavy lifting, pushing or pulling greater than 15 pounds. With a deep flap, it's three months of no heavy lifting, pushing or pulling greater than 15 pounds. Um, and then again, we have to be very careful with what kind of exercises we do with our core um, for the first eight months because we don't want to get a hernia or bulge with this. Um, so there are many different ways in which we can reconstruct a breast. Um, a lot of patients that undergo autologous tissue, meaning your own tissue, um, first are patients who have the appropriate anatomy for that, okay, have enough abdominal tissue in order to be able to do the operation um, or haven't had surgeries that preclude them from uh, being good candidates. Um, but also, um, you know, we used to tell patients or when we first started offering this operation, it was a lot of times patients who chose this operation were Patients who are having radiation therapy, where implants were not a good choice, or patients had complications from implant. So infection, where they lost the implant and, and didn't have enough skin coverage to, to try again. Um, but, but now we do this with such regularity, uh, much shorter operative times, that I offer this to any patient who's a good candidate up front. And a lot of patients are choosing this because they don't like the idea of having to deal with implants for the rest of their lives. So for those patients, um, I tell everybody you pay a lot up front for this operation, but at the end of the day, you never have to deal with an implant or the complications that arise with that um, as well. So you guys had fin um, sent in uh, a couple of questions and one of the questions was, when am I finished with reconstruction? <laughs> it's like, it, you, yeah. this person, it's like, when am I, when do I know I'm finished and it's good and, or, or you, like you were saying, if I understood, it's like, you may always, if you go the implant route, mm -hmm. you may, I mean, are you ever done? And yeah. the deep flap, it sounds mm -hmm. like you're done if mm -hmm. that works really well, mm -hmm. so. You know, I, no matter what kind of reconstruction you do, whether it be implant-based or autologous tissue, um, the deep flap, you know, I always tell patients expect revisions. Um, and so I think that the answer to that question kind of differs between the two. Now for a deep flap, I still tell patients to expect revisions, you know, maybe one flap is larger than the other and we have to make it more symmetric or, you know, you have standing cone deformities or what mm -hmm. patients refer to as dog ears, mm -hmm. um, smaller revisions like that. The nice thing with the deep flap is when you're done, you're happy with it, you're done, okay? Provided no complications right. down the road. With implant-based reconstruction, it's the same thing. I think once you have that silicone implant in and you're happy with how things look, leave it alone, you're done, okay? Um, obviously, my goal as a plastic surgeon and someone who does a lot of breast reconstruction is to get my patients feeling like they're whole again, where they can look in a mirror and they don't think cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, is it always possible? Not necessarily, but that's, that's what my goal is. And so I think when we achieve that and patients feel comfortable with themselves, um, they feel good, they feel pretty again, mm -hmm. then I think we're done. Now again, with implants, if you were to rupture later or get caps or contractures later down the line, um, then we would have to deal with it then. But I tell patients, try not to worry about that. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't know when it will happen, if you know, happen. if it will happen, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. 
So don't, I know that we have a great network and we always seek out people that are like, oh, another survivor, what was your experience? Mm -hmm. But not every experience is the same. No, so just very case, different. Absolutely. Everybody's body is so different. Yeah. And so you can't assume that you'll react the same way. Correct. No matter what it Correct. is. Correct. Yeah. One, the, another question, is it possible to have an allergic reaction to breast implants? Breast implants are supposed to be inert, so no. Um, there's a lot of, you know, um, I guess talk in social media regarding um, breast-related uh, or implant-related illness. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm not sure if the data will pan out. Mm -hmm. I will say some patients do feel better when we remove their implant. Is it an allergy? No. Okay. It's just their, maybe their response to the implant, their body's response to it. Right. It's not positive. It could be. It could be. Um, it's not something that's well scientifically, yeah. you know. Um, the research isn't the, the there research yet. The research isn't there yet. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, everybody feels what they feel. Mm -hmm. And if you feel that this is secondary to your implants, then we remove them. I just tell patients, you may not feel better after this, but some do. And mm -hmm. so... We just may not have a way of being able to quantify that yet. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. And we always say, listen to your body. Exactly. Right? So Absolutely. The patient knows their body better than anyone. 100%. 100%. Another question. If I have a large breast, are expanders necessary? Can I skip the expanders or can I skip the expanders and go right to the implant? That is a great question. Um, short answer. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't personally like to do that because if a patient has a large breast, where you have the excess skin is not necessarily where I want my implant to fall. Okay. So oftentimes what I'll do in patients that come in with a larger breast where we're not saving the nipple and, and mm -hmm. can't go direct to implant, I do like to put an expander in because I like to be able to mold that pocket exactly where I want it. I do think it gives you a better aesthetic outcome mm -hmm. and I like to expand the skin where it needs to be expanded to achieve better projection and roundness of the of the overall breast. Okay, that makes sense. And then can you get breast cancer in a reconstructed breast? So you can get breast cancer in the mastectomy flap or the chest wall. Mm -hmm. Obviously you can't get breast cancer in the implant. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're talking about using your abdominal tissue, you cannot get breast cancer in your abdominal tissue. Okay. Okay. But the same thing goes as um, constant monitoring, mm -hmm. follow-up. Usually it's done by physical exam. Okay. Um, but like I said, you can get breast cancer in the mastectomy flap itself, but not in the flap that, that we itself. bring from the, from the abdomen. Yeah. That makes sense. And so the surveillance for that would be a physical exam once you have that done, or is it? Yes, and, okay. and again, that may differ for patients depending on the location of their tumor. Um, I leave that up to the surgical oncologist and the oncologist. Okay. Yeah. And then what is the longevity, average longevity of an implant? That's hard to say. <laughs> so we used to say 10 years, you remove right. them, replace mm -hmm. them for fear of rupture. Well, the implants that we put in now, um, highly cohesive or gummy bear implants, they're just getting better, they're, you know, so we don't have necessarily 10 year data on them. Okay. Basically what I tell my patients now is if they're not causing you a problem, we don't think they're ruptured, leave them alone. Okay. If they do in the future, then we can get an MRI or imaging to, to detect if they're ruptured or just reoperate at that time. Okay. Are there any new improvements in breast implants that will last a lifetime? <laughs> I don't think so. Don't think so. <laughs> I'd be rich. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, I want that patent. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. So, yeah, lifetime's not going to happen. But with, yeah, that, that would be, man, you would be yeah. rich. Right? Yeah. Okay, if I select to have a deep flat reconstruction, is it one time and done? So that, I mean, I think you answered that, but just to reiterate, it's, I, like I said, I tell every patient, no matter what kind of reconstruction, expect a second operation for, for a little finessing. Now, there are a lot of patients that have deep flaps that have beautiful outcomes, especially nipple sparing candidates that don't need anything afterwards. And if, but I don't, I, I just tell patients expect that. If we don't have to do anything, then perfect. Okay, good. And then from your perspective, from a plastic surgeon's point of view, is there a benefit to have a double mastectomy when it's an option, but not necessarily required? That's, a, that's a very good question. 
Um, and so from an aesthetic standpoint, to achieve symmetry, mm -hmm. okay, again, it's hard to achieve symmetry between a uh, breast that's been reconstructed with an implant and then a native breast that doesn't, beha that doesn't behave like an implant. Um, and so from an aesthetic standpoint, yes. Now, I say that with caution because if your lifetime risk of developing breast cancer in the other breast goes back down to that of the normal population, you're not a BRCA carrier, you don't have like an ATN mutation, you don't have genetic predisposition to breast cancer, it is, you should think of it like operating on another body part, okay? Mm -hmm. And so the more you operate, the higher risk of complications. And so how I put it to patients is, I think if you are very anxious that you're going to develop breast cancer in the contralateral breast and you're just not going to be able to relax or, or, or think about anything else, then that may be something that you need to do for yourself. But to do it from an aesthetic standpoint, I always say, what if we had a complication and lost the implant on the non-cancer side, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's what I always present to patients. And, and then I leave it to you. And obviously your surgical oncologist has to be comfortable doing contralateral mastectomy if it's indicated. Um, but I don't necessarily think it should be a knee-jerk reaction. Yes, I'm going to get contralateral mastectomy because I want them to look the same. The same. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's that risk-reward thing. And you absolutely. Have to... Absolutely. Okay. okay. Now, the other question was, what are, option, what are the options after a failed implant breast reconstruction? Should you try a different type of reconstruction if the implant failed? So it, that's where the deep or autologous tissue reconstruction comes into play. And so... Again, the most common ones are using your back muscle, the latissimus, which still requires an implant to achieve any, um, any uh, I guess, perceivable amount of breast mass um, or the deep flap. And so in some patients who've had infection, yes, it is possible to go back, re-expand, and then try implant-based reconstruction again. Um, but if those patients are good candidates for deeps, then in my practice, because I can do that operation, I will offer that to them. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. This is just yeah. crazy. This is not on the list, but I have to ask it. So on the deep flap, or if you're using another part of the body yeah. To, yeah. to create a breast, does that body part, like if it's your abdominal, part of your abdominal muscle coming up, like when you laugh or sneeze, does it react the same in the no. new location? <laughs> I mean, like, no, I because there's like, no, oh. there's no muscle okay. associated with it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no. Like, okay. <laughs> if I laugh, is it like my abdominals just moved up, right? Like, no, no, no. I thought about that. It'll move like your other breasts. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. And the next question was, I was told I should wear a prosthetic after my mastectomy if I choose not to have reconstruction because having only one breast could cause back pain. I, hmm. So I guess they're saying they were told they have to wear a pro or should wear a prosthetic. Yeah. Maybe they're a larger breast on one side, so it kind of the balance. There may there. be some truth to that. Really? I, I guess know. I've not really explored. Me about either. That. I guess it does make sense, though, if you're pulling one side exactly. versus the other. But if you think if you have a really heavy breast, then that prosthetic's got to be pretty heavy to match. So oh, maybe. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. And then another question was, what causes breast implant displacement? If it happens, it is. If it happens, is it safe to have another implant, or what would my choices be? So, anytime we put any sort of implant in our body, whether it be, an, you know, a breast implant, the port, a knee, mm -hmm. we develop scar tissue, and that's what we refer to when we talk about the capsule. Okay, and so the scar tissue that we develop around the implant is of different thickness in different patients. And so a lot of times, and that's part of the reason why I like to put expanders in, in patients with much larger breasts or larger chest wall, is so that you have time to develop that capsule around the implant. So once I put the implant in, it kind of holds that implant in place. Now, just like the rest of our tissue that's elastic, that scar tissue can also stretch. The capsule can stretch, the mastectomy can stretch, the mastectomy mm -hmm. skin can stretch as well. Um, due to gravity, what have you. And so that's what causes the displacement is that capsule enlarges around the implant, allows the implant more room to shift. 100% you can definitely get, and that's a large reason for a lot of the reconstruction revisions we do. 
is to go in and um, move that or close that capsule down and move that implant over. Um, and it's a large reason why I tell all of my patients, breast dog patients, mastectomy patients, it's very important to wear a good supportive bra afterwards. And I tell all of my implant patients to wear one when they sleep. You know, they hate me for it and they argue, but but mm. when you think about it, when you lay on your back, gravity yeah. will pull the implants on the side. And that's why you get the lateral displacement. Oh. Mm, good to know. So you think you're not, they're where they need to be and yeah. you think, oh, I can be bra free, but not really. Not That's really. Not recommended. No, I don't recommend it. Okay. Yeah. Hmm, who knew? I, well, we know now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so another question was, can you do a breast lift at the same time you have a lumpectomy and how long would it last? You can do the breast lift or reduction at the same time as lumpectomy. Mm -hmm. It's called an oncoplastic breast reduction or oncoplastic okay. mastectomy. And, and we do that quite a bit. I will say, actually, if you do that, the radiated side, so the lumpectomy side will become radiated. And actually, that breast usually ends up lasting in that shape a little bit longer, mm -hmm. which is kind of counterintuitive right. because we know that radiation causes all this damage. But it also causes the skin envelope to shrink down a little mm -hmm. bit, which is akin to a lift right. and so um, in those patients the radiated side mm -hmm. will actually probably lift up a little bit higher and yeah. stay in its position maybe a little bit longer hmm. okay so what causes a silicone implant to rupture Could, just a weakness in the in the outer shell, outer shell mm -hmm. it? okay and then the following question was how is that detected is it by a mammogram can a mammogram detect a ruptured implant no, so that's a good question. So the only imaging modality that we have that detects um, silicone implant rupture with mm -hmm. any certainty is an MRI. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. And once you have implants, is it safe to do a mammogram? Yes, but not... Uh, yes, and we do it for breast augmentation patients, for okay. example, uh, but not necessary. Okay. And probably, again, most of the follow-up for breast recurrence in a mastectomy patient is done by physical exam on the mastectomy right. flaps. But again, if they're worried about chest wall recurrence, mm -hmm. then they're probably going to do something like an MRI. Okay. Mm -hmm. And after reconstruction, and that probably depends on what type, mm -hmm. um, when am I able to start exercising again? Is it better to start off with light hand weld weights or TheraBand exercises or yoga poses like on the hands and knees? You know, just in sure. general, I think they're asking. Yeah. Them, so. I don't re recommend yoga uh, immediately after or usually at least within the first six weeks because mm -hmm. you're putting a lot of your body weight on your arms and you're engaging your pectoralis major muscle a lot during yoga. Um, I generally tell patients, again, no heavy lifting, pushing, or pulling greater than 15 pounds for six weeks. Okay. And then after that, you can slowly build back slowly up. Slowly build yep. back up so it is better to start. Mm -hmm. And then what is the purpose of massaging and trying to move the breast mm -hmm. after reconstruction? I'm afraid I'm going to dislodge them. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody says once I start moving exactly. them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, woo. Yeah. So the purpose of moving them again um, when we talk about that capsule, it's a fine line of that capsule surrounding the implant being too big and too small. When the capsule is too small, it's called capsular contracture and it mm -hmm. squishes the implant and it causes distortion of the implant and will pull and move it into places we don't want it to go. So we move the implants medially and superiorly, which are both directions that it's okay for the, move, for the implants to go. We don't want them okay. to go down or out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's to keep the capsule open a little bit bigger than the implant so it doesn't okay. it doesn't contract mm -hmm. around the implant oh, wow. mm -hmm. okay. yeah i would be afraid to do that too right? yeah. so those were all the submitted questions do we have questions coming in we had a few but you actually did we cover the them one. yeah okay, like, great. Can I go back? <laughs> those like, are really good questions weren't they, they great were really questions? good questions what are the you. warning signs of implant failure i believe you talked about that right you warning wanted. signs of implant failure would be so for example i'm assuming rupture um would probably be uh, capsular contracture, okay, or um, distortion of the breast. And can you ex and you probably did, but I'm I'm forgetting that the caps. Oh. The capsule is the scar tissue okay. again that All forms right. around yeah. the implant. So, yeah. And so, okay, got it. So that would be okay. another one. Was uh, I have pain at time? Could it be scar tissue? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yep. And in fact, pain associated with like hardness of the breast yeah. is considered a grade four capsular contracture. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, that's um, definitely an indication for reoperation or um, revision. I have a question related to scar tissue. And I, again, I didn't have, I wasn't a good candidate for reconstruction mm -hmm. for a number of reasons, yeah. but 
Um, are some people more prone to scar t developing scar tissue? Their bodies just develop more than the average, you know, like mm -hmm. different levels of scarring? I'm sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, because it seems like, sir, I was told, oh my gosh, one time I had a surgery and it was like, oh, there was a lot of scar tissue mm -hmm, in that. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering, are some people more prone to developing more scar tissue than others? Is it a... Yeah, I, I'm sure there is. Okay. Just like certain patients keloid, you know, yep. and others yep. don't. And I think it also depends on how long you wait between operations mm -hmm. on how much scar tissue you, okay. your surgeon actually sees at the time of operation. Obviously, the longer you wait, mm -hmm. the less the, okay. the less scar tissue you will you'll you'll, have. Yeah. Okay. Right. Question just came in. How frequently do you place an implant in front of the muscle in, in front of the muscle in mastectomy patients? Oh. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I would say I probably put implants in front of the muscle now about 40 oh. 40 percent of okay. the time. Um, and it depends on a few things. Um, one, it, it first and foremost depends on flap thickness. So if you are some someone who's very thin and you know has very thin mastectomy flaps because you don't have a lot of um, a lot of subcutaneous tissue, mm -hmm. then putting them in front of the muscle is not that advantageous because then you can see more of the rippling of the implant, mm -hmm. etc. Um, but there are a lot of patients who we get excellent flaps from our our surgical oncologists, and so it does make it um, it does make it possible to put in front of the muscle. Right. And for all deep flap reconstruction, I put all the flaps in front of the muscle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are the advantages of in front or behind? What is there an advantage? Yeah. So the advantages of putting it in front is less pain. Okay, and then, and again, what we talked about with animation deformity, when you flex your pec muscle, does it distort the implant? So when it's in front of the muscle, it won't do that. Mm -hmm. Also, I think in some patients, we're able to achieve, and this is probably just my experience, but better projection, and that means how far the implant sticks out from the chest wall. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is also a good thing for certain patients, right? Um, but advantages to putting them under the muscle is that the superior portion of the muscle will be covered, uh, superior portion of the implant, I'm sorry, will be covered by the muscle. So it, it gives us a little bit more coverage of the implant. Okay. So you may not see all the, the ripples yeah, and the step off yeah, of the implant. We have three more questions coming on. How much time you got? Yeah, are you good? Sure, yeah. sure. So can you have a deep flap after three C-sections? Yes, 100%. So actually, um, I had a patient come to me and say, oh, I saw a surgeon who didn't do deep flaps and they said that, you know, I had a C-section, so I'm not a good candidate. That's actually opposite. Hmm. Actually, when you have a C-section, um, because when they uh, make that incision, they're cutting through some of the blood vessels, it causes the other blood vessels that are there to get bigger and hmm. to take up the slack, so to speak. Okay. So it's what we call like a delayed phenomenon. So actually patients who get C-sections actually um, may have better, more favorable vascular anatomy or venous drainage. Mm. Mm -hmm. Should give a thumbs up on that. <laughs> <laughs> Should I be excited? Like, oh, yeah. So yeah. what future scanning do you recommend after you do a deep flap? After I do a deep flap, so again, I don't recommend any of the follow-up other than when I do a physical exam. If we, and, and there's not great um, guidelines as to how we follow patients post mastectomy reconstruction okay. um, in terms of imaging. So basically what happens is if we feel a lump, if the patient feels a mass, um, then what we do at that time, if it's concerning, we get an ultrasound and then escalate the imaging from there as necessary. And then of course, depending on what your surgical oncologist right. thinks, yeah. I think that's an important point because there's a there's a there is although you work together the surgical oncology is the one that is deciding what that surveillance is and working with you based mm -hmm. on what you Absolutely. do for reconstruction but it's still up to that surgical oncologist mm -hmm. what the surveillance or the follow up is. Yeah. It's good to know. I think that's a big question for so many is it's like okay which do I do and who's You know, I think driving at, the bus. At right? the end of the day patients a lot of times we'll direct those questions to me anyway mm -hmm. because I, I do see them more right, right. because I did the the bigger yep. part of the operation not mm -hmm. not the more important part by any means no. but but um, definitely the one that requires more follow-up more operating you know mm -hmm. uh, just looking at the implants down the line or, or, or seeing how the deep flap settles etc so those questions will often come to me just because they see me more sure. And the nice thing about working in such a big institution where we have everybody, you know, everyone's a phone call away, I just literally will step out of the room, call Dr. Maxwell, call Dr. Thayer, call Dr. Silva and say, 
or or the guys at Methodist and just say, you know, this is what I found. How do you want me to work this up? Mm -hmm. And then just go from there. And I'm happy to order those tests, et cetera. So that's great. Don't ever feel that if you if you have a concern, you should be able to talk to any of your surgeons and, and right. of course us as well. So. Yeah, and then that way you're they're seeing you more and then because mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of times they are more comfortable because they see you more and you're yeah. more in there. Or it's just more accessible. Accessible. Yeah. 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 I think that's a good point. You don't have to oh let me call or let Absolutely. me make another appointment. Absolutely. It's unnecessary yeah. when I There's no wrong question you. to either parties okay you know. that's awesome yeah good to know. so there's two more that have come in uh what builds the breast after you move the deep flap up so what builds the breast is the skin and fat from the abdomen and so depending on um you know if if you have a big skin envelope if you have nipple sparing what we do is we we just take the the fat part of the of the flap and bury it completely under the mastectomy skin um, or sometimes if you don't have any skin, like say you're a delayed reconstruction or you've had radiation and skin damage, then what we do is replace a lot of that radiated skin with your belly skin mm. and then build the breast up with the fat underneath. That does sound like a complex surgery, but a beneficial one, like you could like whittle down your waist a little bit at the same time, right? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that is a nice, like the icing exactly. on the cake for the patient, the but the by no means reason to do this operation. <laughs> exactly. I would not want to do it, but yeah. it's like, okay, it's a little cherry. Yes, on sure. Top. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Like something that's yes, like, yes, yes. a little bit better. So another question came in and said, can you tell us about fat grafting? Ooh. Yes. So fat grafting is um, liposectioning fat. Um, and then basically we inject it into the breast. Um, and the thought process behind that is that we're introducing stem cells, so the stem cells from fat into this area that may help to bulk up uh, the mastectomy flaps a little bit and try and hide contra irregularities. So there's some benefit to for patients who are not good candidates for DEEP that are getting radiation therapy. A lot of those patients I will fat graft at the time of their second stage or before. Um, and there's been some data that shows that this may have a beneficial effect on the radiation changes that happen mm -hmm. um, because of the stem cells. Um, the other patients that we do this for are patients that have, that I put prepec in front of the muscle that you may see some contra irregularities or even patients behind the muscle that have contra irregularities. It's a nice way of hiding some of those rippling and okay. that, some of that rippling and um, loss of, of upper pole upper fullness. Pole. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's, all the questions that I have live. Awesome. All right. That was a lot of questions. We had a lot submitted and a lot. Thank you guys so much. And thank, yes, thank you, you, Dr. Wong, for oh, I mean, pleasure, educating yeah. us and helping us learn more about such an important topic. Mm -hmm. oh, one just came in. Do you oh. do liposuction to get rid of excess fat during the deep flap? Mm. No. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that, the, the, deep, the deep flap is on average anywhere from six to eight hours. Um, my wow. goal at that time is to get the patient safely off the table yeah. in in a in the shortest amount of time possible and get those flaps up and running um and so no nothing it would be extra. nice but no nothing yeah extra. yeah nothing that adds to the the timing of the surgery yeah makes sense good question everyone thank you all so so very much for joining us and being patient and coming back about yeah. four or five times with the failed attempt we're now doing this on my phone i was just like <laughs> sitting there and i'm like oh and so we just are using the phone right now but we are recording this and so there will be a professional recorded version on youtube we'll let you guys will post it once it's available but thanks for your patience um a very important topic and we're thrilled to have you and can't thank you enough it's so my pleasure. Thank you guys, and Thank you. Um, for more information, um, we will also post information on how to contact your office. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously, Project Pink is projectpink.org, or call our um, phone number if you have questions, 402-905-0691. And check out our calendar. There is an exciting live panel um, next month, I believe, that is regaining intimacy after breast cancer. And we've got two really brave survivors, young survivors and their husbands, with their therapists that are willing to talk about some of the challenges they face 
in their relationship, whether it be communication or whether it's how to talk to one another about this disease and this journey and keep those lines of communication open. And we're super excited that they're that brave to share oh, this. Yeah. And so we're really thrilled and that will be live and we don't record live panels. So go online, register and be there. It's February 13th. So perfect time for Valentine's Day. So thank you again. And we look forward to the next straight talk without all the technical complications. <laughs> Thanks. Good night.